Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to look at input sources. These Simulink library blocks are so important that they really merit their own lecture. Let's go ahead and open our Simulink library browser and get started. From there, I'll navigate to the sources section to view the input blocks. One of the most common Simulink inputs is the constant block, which we discussed in the last lecture. Unfortunately, the constant block is just that, constant. Oftentimes, we want dynamic inputs, so today, we'll look at our options. The first kind of dynamic input that we may want is a clock or a digital clock input. If you are running a continuous time simulation, you'll want to use a clock input rather than a digital clock input. If your simulation is running in discrete time, you'll want to use a digital clock input. Maybe you're not sure which to use. In general, I recommend keeping things in continuous time and using the clock input rather than the digital clock input. But if you need to work with a discrete time system, say for your research or if you're planning to compile your code and run it on real world hardware and want to simulate the rest of your logic first, then a digital clock would be a better choice for you. Sometimes you want something to happen after a set period of time and these inputs help you do that. For example, let's say that I want to output a counter that counts up once per second during the first five seconds of simulation and then I want to hold my current value for the next five seconds of simulation. Let's go ahead and put that logic together in a model now. So once again, I'm going to navigate to New in MATLAB and select Simulink Model. There are a few different ways to implement this logic, but I'm going to select an approach that uses another helpful block, the switch block. To create this example model, I'm going to pull in two constant blocks from the commonly used block section of the library browser, as well as a sum block a switch, and a scope. I'm also going to pull a unit delay from the discrete section. And in addition, I'm going to pull in the digital clock from the sources section. Usually, I would hide the block names to clean up the model's appearance, but in this case, I'll leave them in place so that you can easily see how each block is used. I'm going to arrange the digital clock to feed into the middle input in the switch, and I'm going to set the switch condition to 5, since I want the switch to take action only after 5 seconds have passed. A switch block takes an input value, compares it to a threshold, which we could make a tunable parameter just like we did with the constant block in the last lesson, and the switch outputs its top input if the condition is true, and its bottom input if its condition is false. So basically, it uses its second input to decide whether the first input or the third input should be passed through. I'm going to feed a zero from my first constant block into the first input of the switch, and a one from my second constant block into the third input of the switch. The output of the switch will feed into the summation block, and the output of the summation block, which just adds two inputs, will be fed into a scope block. Scope blocks are extremely helpful outputs. They let you see a time trace of a signal so that you can observe how a value is changing dynamically over time, and we'll look at them in more detail in the next lesson, but we'll use them a little bit starting with this lesson. I'm also going to feed the output of the summation block into a unit delay, and I'll feed the unit delay back into the summation block's second input. Lastly, I'm going to go to the model configuration parameters under the simulation menu option. And I'm going to set up the solver to run with a fixed step. I'm also going to use a discrete solver. And then I'll go to the advanced options and set my step size to one second and then OK this. Now let's think about what this model does. In the first five seconds of the simulation, the switch block's criteria isn't true. That is, the clock hasn't passed the five second mark, so the switch block outputs a one, which is fed into the summation block. The summation block adds the current value to the previous value. Each one second time step, a value of one, is added to the previously sum total, so this logic counts up by one each second. After we pass the five second mark, the switch block will pass through the first input, which is zero. Since we will then add zero to our sum value at each subsequent time step, the logic will hold in the value that it had counted up to, 
at the five second mark. So essentially we've created count and hold or count and freeze logic. Let's run the simulation and examine the scope output to verify that the logic works as expected. Indeed, we count up for the first five seconds and then hold the counter's value after five seconds. A final comment that I want to make on scopes. Scope blocks are a really common output when I am running simulations, they are my go-to simulation output. They allow me to see how a signal is changing graphically, which is something that I won't get from a numeric display output. As it turns out, Simulink has some other nice inputs, like a counter free running block that has already been implemented so that we don't have to implement counter logic. This is nice. This block just continually counts up. Also, we have a counter limited block, which counts up to a threshold that we specify and can then be automatically reset. This might be nice to have if you want to implement some simple Boolean logic in Simulink and then check the truth table for the logic, for example. What if you have a complicated custom input or a large truth table to check? The signal builder block may be just right for you. You can set up your own custom signals with this block, or if you want a more complicated set of inputs, maybe you want to feed several custom inputs into a model at once, you can even set up an Excel spreadsheet with the input names at the top of each column and the values to feed in below the input name. Put a timestamp in the leftmost column, import the Excel spreadsheet into the signal builder block, and it can run some very complex test vectors for you. This can be really nice for testing more complicated logic for which there are many possible states when you need to make sure that all of them produce the expected output or outputs. The random number and uniform random number blocks are helpful when your algorithm needs random numbers for something like seed values for an artificial intelligence or computational intelligence algorithm. Your use case for whether you need your random numbers uniformly distributed or in a Gaussian slash bell curve distribution will dictate which of these blocks you use. The band-limited white noise block can also be helpful as something you add to another input when you are simulating noise on a signal. For example, to simulate noise coming from an external real-world sensor. The in block shows up all the time when you're working with subsystems, which I highly recommend for splitting up your logic and making it easy to read and follow. I'll discuss subsystems more in an upcoming lesson. It can also be used frequently in cases where you're going to compile to embedded code. The sine wave and step inputs are helpful for certain cases. For example, you can use them to look at the time domain response of a control system, or to trigger an event that relies on a rising edge, or to test the way that logic responds to a sign change. Note that although the step input shows a step up, you can also use it to step down, and it comes with the option for a built-in time delay. The sine wave block has even more options, allowing you to use time-based values for continuous time simulation or sample-based values for discrete time simulation. You can set your frequency, amplitude, and phase delay, which can make this block ideal for testing, among other things. The from file and from workspace inputs are also helpful on occasion. From file allows you to use data in a mat file, which is a MATLAB native data file as an input to your model. And from workspace allows you to use, for example, an array of values with accompanying timestamps as an input. I've used this to do things like run real world data recorded from a sensor input through some logic and see how the logic responds. This can be helpful both for debugging some logic that doesn't work as intended with hardware, and also for making sure that your logic handles real-world data as you expect it to when you're in the midst of implementing a design. There are a few other input sources here that I didn't mention. I tend not to use most of them very frequently, and I don't usually see other people using some of these very often, but perhaps someone in some other field might use them a lot. So if any of these look helpful to you, by all means, take the time to examine them and understand what configuration options are available and how they work. In the next lesson, we'll investigate outputs in detail.